In this module, I'm going to talk some about how t-tests are used in the literature. I'm going to give some examples of how they look. We're going to do a lot of practice questions and activities here, so please have a paper ready that you can use to um, write down your answers to several questions that I'm going to ask as we go through these um, through these peer-reviewed journal articles. Another objective that I have for this module is to help you learn how to identify what kind of t-test you need to use in any given research situation and to write out the null and alternative hypotheses in statistical notation. Um, those concepts should just be review, but it's important that you be able to do these things because in the upcoming exam, I'm not going to tell you what kind of t-test to run. I'm going to give you some example questions of research scenarios, and you're going to have to decide, given the scenario I've described, whether it's uh, what kind of t-test it is, how many tails the test requires, how to write out the null and alternative hypotheses, given that kind of t-test, and then be able to run the t-test. And so, um, just as good practice and preparation for that, I wanted to walk through that kind of uh, exercise as well. Just as a reminder, there are three kinds of t-tests. These are the last three modules that we've worked through. The single sample t-test, independent samples, and repeated measures. The single sample t-test looks something like this. You have a population with a known mean. You remove from it a sample and give it a treatment. You take that treated sample and compare it to the population that didn't have a treatment to see if there's a difference between the treated sample and the population. <clears throat> Remember that when we learned in this module about this kind of t-test, that it didn't have to be compared against a population with a known mean. It could be compared against um, a hypothesized value or um, some value that's based on logic or your specific research paradigm. If you recall back to that module, we used as an example infants staring at ugly or attractive faces for um, a mat for, for a total of 20 seconds, and we thought if they didn't have a preference, they would split that time evenly, 10 and 10. And so we hypothesized that the treated that the that the infants would look at the face for sorry at the attractive face for 10 seconds if the null hypothesis were true. And in that case, we don't we didn't actually um, administer a treatment, but we still consider it the same kind of scenario where um, we have a, a single sample that we've, um, like a single sample of infants that we've required to do uh, one thing, look at faces, and we're just comparing them against a logical value. So, it, so even though this is what it typically looks like, this is the typical research scenario, it doesn't always look like that. An independent sample scenario looks something like this. You have a population. We usually don't know the mean of that population. We draw from it two samples. One is the control sample that doesn't receive a treatment, and the other one receives a treatment. And we compare here the treated sample versus the control sample, and we see do they have the same average or mean on uh, as each other. And if they don't have the same mean, the control sample represents the population. We don't know what the population mean is, but we can guess that it's probably the same or very close to the same as the control sample because these people came from this population and represent it. And if the treated sample is higher or lower than that, that means the treatment made the scores higher or lower. It made it better or worse. So we compare these two samples to each other. And these samples, this is, sorry, this t-test is called an independent samples t-test because these two samples are independent of each other. They are not related in any way. They're not the same people. They're not the same, uh, they, they haven't gone through the same paradigm, the same treatment. Um, they, they've just been independently drawn and they're independently compared to each other. Um, I do want to note before we move on that uh, um, sometimes an independent samples t-test 
won't look like this. It will um, be similar, but sometimes you might have a second treated over uh, a second treated group over here, and um, you might compare one treatment versus another kind of treatment. So instead of taking a control sample, it might be like um, we have one group do the Atkins diet and another group do the Weight Watchers diet. Remember we learned about that example. And so sometimes you use two treated groups and you compare them to each other to see if the treated uh, if the treated populations from which they imaginarily had come would be different. And then finally the repeated measures design looks something like this. You have a population from which you draw a sample. You measure the mean of that sample, then give it a treatment, and then measure it again. The same sample a second time, and you compare, the red arrow here represents the comparison, between the initial sample and the same people once they've been treated, and you're seeing is there a difference between their scores in the first time and the second time. Now again, just like with the other two examples that I gave, it doesn't always look exactly like this. Sometimes you've drawn a sample from the population and you actually give it a treatment here before you measure it the first time. So you might say, um, we want to see what happens if we uh, draw a group of people and we force them to um, study a, a book on print versus if we make them study a book on a computer. And so we've actually done something to them both times. The first time it would be print and the second time the, the second treatment would be the computer. And then you compare their scores on the two conditions. But in in wh whatever this research scenario is, you've taken the same people and you've repeated their measures. And so that's the reason why we call it this repeated measures. We've measured the same people more than once. So now let's move into some examples of how the t-tests are used in the literature. This short report is called, Does This Recession Make Me Look Black? The Effect of Resource Scarcity on the Categorization of Biracial Faces. This is a whimsical and fun little paper. Um, and I think, uh, hopefully you enjoy it as much as I did. The introduction reads, and just bear with me, we're gonna read it together. In-group biases are a ubiquitous feature of human social life. One explanation offered for these biases is that they arise from resource competition between groups. In this view, hostility toward the outgroup is predicted to occur when people's access to a resource is constrained or when they seek to justify an existing resource advantage. So they're saying here that we are biased toward people that are in our same in-group, our same in-group. And the reason why that might be is because of resource competition. If there's scarcity, if there's a lack of resources, then we might want to uh, exclude people who would be a drain on those resources. So in that view, if that were the case, then we would have feelings of hostility or anger toward other people who aren't like us if there is a limit of resources, if the resource is constrained, or if there is one group that has more resources than the other and we want to justify that. So in the studies reported here, we extended this logic to test a novel prediction about in-group boundary formation, specifically whether resource scarcity decreases the inclusiveness of racial in-groups. Now, you don't know what that means yet because we haven't read on, but what, what they're talking about here is if you have a person who is biracial, they could be categorized as either white or black. And we're testing whether a, a person who is biracial is more likely to be included in the group that's the same as the respondent in the study, or if the respondent rejects them and pushes them into the other group, depending on whether there is resource uh, scarcity, like they described up here, or if there's uh, an imbalance in resources that are trying to be justified. So the cost of having unrestricted in-group boundaries may be relatively low during times of abundance. 
that means it might not matter that much if we include people who aren't quite like us in our group. So if we don't have restrictions about our boundaries, our in-group boundaries, it might be fine to just include them in our group if there's enough to go around. During times of scarcity, however, individuals may narrow their definition of belongingness to include only those whose group membership is unambiguous. So they're saying during, if there's times of scarcity, we might say, uh -uh, you're not like me. If you're a, even a little bit, even a titch not like me, then you are not in my group. As long as there's scarcity, that might happen. We conducted two experiments in which people were primed with cues to scarcity or abundance and were then asked to categorize biracial faces as being black or white. So when it says that they were, there were cues to scarcity or abundance. That means there is something that would trigger thoughts of scarcity, a lack of resources, or abundance, a plenty of resources. And then, like it says, they were showed biracial faces that were, um, uh, and, and then the participants were told that they needed to uh, categorize whether that person is black or white. We predicted that willingness to include racially ambiguous individuals as part of their racial in-group would be lower in participants primed with scarcity cues than in participants primed with abundance cues. So what they predicted here is if the participants themselves are white, then they would be more likely to include the biracial people in their own group and say, oh yeah, that's, that's white, that's white enough, if there was abundance. But if there was scarcity, they would say, ah, 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 that person's not white, that person is black. All right, study one, let's see what actually happened. 71 white undergraduates participated in study one for course credit and underwent a priming procedure similar to that used in another study. In the scarcity condition, they viewed a slideshow consisting of captioned pictures of economic hardship. For example, a picture of an empty office with captions about a dearth of good jobs. So it's like, oh man, there's just not enough work to go around. In the abundance condition, they viewed a slideshow consisting of captioned pictures suggesting prosperity, like a picture of a thriving office with captions about there being plenty of good jobs. Participants in both conditions then viewed photographs of 20 biracial faces, 10 male, 10 female. For each face, participants were asked, if you had to choose, would it be more accurate to describe this biracial individual as black or white? The faces were created by averaging one white and one black face using a face averaging software program. So that means they weren't actually literally biracial individuals. They took a picture of a white person and a picture of a black person and used a computer algorithm to combine them into a, a single person. The original black and white faces used to make the composite faces were taken from this database. All were forward-facing, neutral profiles. The number of faces participants categorized as black was entered into an independent samples t-test with priming condition as the grouping variable. I'm going to pause here and remind you what the priming condition is. So remember, we were told back here that they were going to be primed with cues of scarcity or abundance. And we read what that was up here when we saw that some people saw PowerPoint slides about economic hardship or economic prosperity. And so we know that the two groups, the priming condition as the grouping variable, the two groups were scarcity versus abundance. As predicted, participants in the scarcity condition categorized more faces as black, mean of 9.35, standard deviation of 2.80, than did those in the abundance condition, with a mean of 7.82, standard deviation of 3.15, comma, t parentheses 69 equals 2.16, comma, p equals 0 0.034, comma, d equals 0.51. All right, what kind of t-test did the researchers perform? Please pause your video, answer the question, write it down, and then move on. 
The answer is independent samples t-test. The way we know that is that it says right here they did an independent samples t-test. And the other way we know is that they compared two groups with each other. What were the two groups that were compared? The two groups were the scarcity versus the abundance conditions. What were the actual means of these two groups? Hopefully you saw that the means were 9.35 and 7.82 listed right there. So 9.35 and 7.82, the answer is B. Was the mean difference between those groups statistically significant? And how do you know? So the answer is yes, they are statistically significant. But how do we know? Because the p-value is less than 0.05. If you look down here, They've listed the p-value differently than we've been doing in class, but if you recall back to previous modules, I have told you before that it's common practice in psychology today to write the exact p-value when a computer gives it to you. And so that's what they've done here in this paper. They've written p equals 0 0.034, but that value right there is actually less than 0.05, and that tells us that this is a statistically significant finding. Practically speaking, how big was the difference between the two means? Hopefully you said the answer was medium, B, because the D tells us what size the difference is. Remember the Cohen's D is scaled as 0.2 being small, 0.5 being medium, and 0.8 being large. And so since we have a D of 0.5, that means we have a medium Cohen's D. Just so you remember, I'd like to remind you now that when we interpret a Cohen's D in terms of what it actually means, we would say these, uh, these two conditions are a half a standard deviation apart, 0.5 standard deviations apart from each other. All right, let's go through a second paper. This one is called Preschoolers Expect Pointers, Even Ignorant Ones, to be Knowledgeable. How can you tell whether someone knows something? One strategy available early in development involves monitoring whether that person had access to the information in the first place. For example, 15-month-olds expect someone who watched an object move from one location to another to look for the object in the new location. They have no such expectation about someone who did not see the object move. And yet, children sometimes mistakenly attribute knowledge to ignorant individuals. Preschoolers who see an object hidden inside a container overestimate the likelihood that someone who has not seen inside the container will know its contents. I'm going to take a moment and explain what this is saying here. It's asking first, how can you tell whether another person, that's not you, has a piece of information inside their head, whether they know something? Early in development, you might try to tell whether that person was present when you as a young person, as an infant, learned a new fact or a piece of information. So these little infants here, that are just over a year old, um, watch an object being moved from, say, the refrigerator to a cupboard. And if somebody was not present in the room, then the infant would think that person will go to the refrigerator because they didn't see it moved away from the refrigerator. If the person goes to the cupboard, the infant will stare a long time because they're surprised about the person not going to the refrigerator. They think the person wasn't there, they shouldn't know the object was moved. But children sometimes get confused about these kinds of things, like what another person has in their head. For instance, if you ask a preschooler what's inside of an object, like what's, sorry, what's inside of a container, 
um, let's say it's like a box labeled um, like crayons. It's like a crayon box. And you open it up and inside is actually hidden candy instead of crayons, then young children get confused. And they assume that if you ask them what, you know, what somebody else would think is in the box, they get confused and assume that everybody else in the world will also know that there's candy inside the box, even though other people haven't seen the contents. So, for these reasons, the, the disconnect between this kind of finding and this kind of finding, where young infants do understand that some folks don't know everything they know, and here where they get confused and think that everyone in the world knows the same things they know, in the study reported here, we investigated whether something as simple as the gesture an ignorant informant uses can lead preschoolers to erroneously attribute knowledge to him or her. So what this is saying here is they were testing to see whether if you just point at something, even if you don't know about it, even if you're just an idiot pointing, if you can confuse preschoolers and lead them to wrongfully think you know what you're talking about or what you're pointing about. We focused on pointing a powerful, ubiquitous means of conveying information. By the age of 14 months, infants search where they see someone point, and preschoolers have difficulty not searching pointed to locations. So infants understand pointing pretty intuitively just by about a year old. They understand that if somebody points, they're trying to communicate something. And if you point to something, even if the infant knows you're wrong, they really struggle not to lurk, look there because they know that pointing is important. And so they're kind of compelled or forced to look, even if they don't want to. For example, in a study by Povinelli and Deblois, children saw one actor hide something in one of several cups concealed behind a screen, while a second actor was out of the room. When the second actor returned, the hider pointed to the baited cup, and the other actor simultaneously pointed to a different, empty cup. Surprisingly, three-year-olds searched the two locations equally. So what this is saying is, one person was in the room. That person hid a ball under a cup. Another person was out of the room and came back in. But if both of those people pointed to cups, the infants knew one of the people was in the room and the other one was out of the room. So they should know which person to trust, the one who hid the ball. But what happens in real life is the infants forget or get confused, can't really comprehend which of the people is knowledgeable, which one is actually pointing at the true location. And so... The, quest the question for this research study is, did seeing the two actors point lead the children to attribute knowledge of the object's location to both of them? Or were the children responding reflexively to the actors' points without making any inferences about their knowledge states? So what this question is asking is, why did the infants get confused in this situation? Was it because they actually put themselves into the heads of the of the folks in the room and they thought that both of them knew what was going on? Or did the children just automatically respond to pointing even if they like d d with that without really thinking about why they were responding? Did they just feel a compulsion, an automatic compulsion to just respond to, to pointing? And so they don't, they don't really pay attention to which of the pointers knows what they're talking about. And so the goal of this study is to see which of these uh, explanations is more true. The method employed was 48 preschoolers with an age range between three and a half years to four and a half years, about half boys and half girls, watched a video featuring two female actors seated side by side. On each of four trials, one actor announced her intention to hide a ball under one of the four cups. The other agreed, covered her eyes, and turned around to face the back wall. So it's like they're playing a game. One of the two actors in this video is like, I'm going to hide a ball! And the other one's like, okay! Covers her eyes, turns around. 
the hider placed a small barrier in front of the cups so that the child could watch as she hid the ball but could not see the particular cup she baited. So the, this is critical here. The hider is masking what's going on with the cups. It's covering the cups, but not covering the actor. So the child still understands that one actor is facing the back wall, one actor is still facing forward, that actor facing forward is playing with the cups, but because the cups have been covered, the child can't see where the ball is being hidden. So the child can't just base it on his or her own knowledge of the cup location. She has to follow the points of the two actors to, in order to find the ball. All right. So the hider, uh, let's see. She announced that she had finished and removed the barrier. So she's like, I'm done. You can look now. Both actors face the camera throughout the rest of the trial. So the other actor turns around and they both face the camera. The children were randomly assigned to three conditions. In the point condition, the two actors simultaneously pointed to three, or sorry, pointed to different cups. In the grasp condition, they simultaneously grasped the tops of different cups. We used grasping as a comparison gesture because young children understood that it, like pointing, is intentional and object-directed. However, it is not often used communicatively, and so may not be as likely as pointing to lead to the misattribution of knowledge. Okay, we're going to take a moment and process what just happened there. So there's two ways that this video can end. Remember, in every video, the two actors are sitting side by side. One turns around. I'm going to hide a ball. Okay. Turns around. The ball gets hidden. I'm done now. Okay. Turns back around. And then the two actors are here. And one of two things happens. The two actors will both point to different cups. Or they will grasp the tops of different cups. And the reason they used the grasp was because they knew that the children would understand that the two actors were trying to find the ball, that they were communicating something about the location of the ball, but the the typical form of communicating that to a child is not by grasping. That's usually done when you're not trying to communicate to another person, but when you're trying to just, uh, like, you can infer the intent from grasping, but it's not intended that the actor communicate with you. And so it's less likely that when you grasp the top of a cup that a young child will get confused and think that it's your intent to um to tell them i know what i'm talking about finally in the baseline condition the two actors simply sat with their hands in their laps so they finished the task and didn't point and didn't grasp they didn't do anything after the actors gestured or in some cases like this control baseline condition or not the experimenter paused the video and asked who knows where the ball is one actor hid the ball on the first and fourth trials the other actor did so on the middle two trials so as you can see the um the preschoolers are watching multiple videos on each of four trials okay so they're seeing multiple trials where uh, where the, um, after each video, they, sorry, during each video, they will either point or grasp or, or not gesture at all. And then the researcher will ask, who knows where the ball is? And, um, the actors will swap the different trials playing the game, who will turn around and face the back wall and who will hide the ball. Okay. Question. In each of the three conditions, the researcher wanted to know whether the child's ability to pick the knowledgeable actor was above chance levels. What would chance performance be on this task? Hopefully you understood that the chance performance here would be two out of four, because on each trial of the four trials, they could pick one actor or the other actor. And that means they have a 50% chance of getting it right each time. If the infant doesn't have a clue who knows where the ball is, then they should get it right just by chance two out of four times, 50% of the time. 
As we're about to read next, the researchers performed three t-tests in the results section, one for each condition. Given what we've discussed so far, what type of t-tests would these need to be in order to compare the actual percent that kids got correct against chance performance, which we just established is 50%. So we're comparing the percentage that kids got right against 50%. Hopefully you said that that was a single sample t-test. The reason why is because we just have a single sample of young infants here, or young toddlers, who are performing in a task that they'll get some percentage right. We don't know yet how what that percentage right is, but we're comparing that value in their samples in each one of those in each one of those um, different uh, conditions against the chance performance, which is 50%. So we're comparing a mean against a hypothesized logical value. Here's the results: children in the grasp and baseline conditions selected the actor who hid the ball as the one who knew its location more frequently than would be expected by chance. T's, in parentheses 15, greater than 3.74, P's, less than 0.01, D's, greater than 0.94. Specifically, children in the grasp condition selected that actor on 3.13 of the four trials, and children in the baseline condition selected her on 3.25 of the four trials. Children in the point condition performed at chance levels, T, parentheses 15, is less than 1, selecting the hider on just 2.13, standard deviation of 1.25, trials. Now I just want to note here that this is an unusual method of reporting statistics because they reported two t-tests at the same time. Notice up here, look, they said t's. T's, not just one T, they put both T's together. The T's were greater than 3.74, which means that the lower of the two T's was 3.74, and the other one was uh, somewhat higher than that. We don't know what it was. And the P's were both less than 0.01. We don't know how low they were, but they were less than 0.01. And the D's were greater than 0.94. That means the lower of the two was 0.94, but the higher one was somewhat higher, and we don't know how high. Um... This doesn't happen very often, but since it does happen from time to time, like here in this paper, it's a short report, so it's only just about two pages, and when a paper's that short, sometimes they make abbreviations like this. So it's good to have exposure to all different types of reporting practices. So even though you won't see this very often, it's important that you recognize that every once in a while you might see two t-tests combined into one reporting right here. It's also unusual to skip reporting the p-value on non-significant t-tests. So here, this t says it's less than 1. Ordinarily, they would put a p-value here that was like p greater than 0.05 or, you know, p equals like 0.67 or whatever it is. They would say the actual p-value, but um, sometimes this happens. And if it happens, then if it happens sometimes, then it's important for me to give you exposure to you to recognize that there even though there's a standard way of reporting these statistics, it's not always followed. It's usually followed, but it's not always followed. And so I wanted to show you some exceptions. Here we see a t-test where the researchers had a group of 16 children watch two actors point to different cups. This one down here. This is the t-test where the children pointed, or sorry, where the researchers pointed to different cups. The children were asked, who knows where the ball is? What do the results of that t-test show? Pause your video and write out a couple of sentences describing what that shows. Hopefully you wrote that in this t-test, the children who point, sorry, the, uh, the children who watch the actors point at the two cups couldn't discern which of the two actors knew the location of the ball, even though they had just watched one of the actors hide the ball, and the other one literally covered her eyes, turned her back to the game, and stared at the wall with her eyes covered. 
the children still couldn't tell which of those two actors knew the location of the ball. We suppose the reason for this is because when the two actors pointed, the children ascribed knowledge to both actors. The children are saying, wow, both of these actors know the location of the ball. They must because they're pointing. That actor who was blindfolded would not possibly be pointing if she didn't know the location of the ball. The fact that she's pointing means she must know. Seeing the two actors point may have led children in the point condition to assume that both were knowledgeable. That's what we just talked about. But it is also possible that these children ignored the test question. Rather than indicating which pointer was knowledgeable, perhaps they reflexively indicated where they would search for the ball, which would also lead to chance performance. So what that's saying is, maybe it wasn't actually about what's going on in the heads of those two actors. Maybe the children were just trying to figure out where they would search for the ball, and so they weren't actually answering the question, who knows where the ball is? They were just like, they, they were just kind of filling in a new question that wasn't asked, something like, where would you look for the ball? One reason to doubt this possibility is that the children tended to respond to the test question by pointing to an actor's face rather than to one of the cups. That happened on most of the trials, like nearly three quarters. However, to investigate this possibility directly, we conducted a control study with eight different children. And there it says their mean age is about four years old, just a little under. Five boys, three girls. And the procedure was the same as in the point condition. But after the actors pointed, the experimenter asked, who hid the ball? Remember the last time it was, who knows where the ball is? This time it's a slightly different question, who hid the ball? And they thought, if pointing automatically triggers a search response, even when the test question does not ask children to indicate where they would search, they should select the two pointers equally, as they did in the point condition, when this procedure is followed. So what they're saying there is, if the process of having the actors point at the cups triggers a search response, like, now the children are not paying attention to the question, they're just focusing on where the ball is hidden and where they would look for it, then you'd expect for the children's behavior to be the same no matter which question gets asked, whether it's who knows where the ball is or who hid the ball. But that's not what happened. In fact, however, the children correctly indicated the hider on 3.89 of the four trials, nearly all the trials, more often than expected by chance. Comma T, parenthesis 7, equals 15, comma P less than 0 0.001, comma D equals 7.59. Thus, children do not automatically respond to pointing by indicating where they would search. So that possible explanation up here is not true. In this second paragraph, we see a t-test where the researchers had eight more children watch two actors point to different cups. This time, the children were asked, who hid the ball? What do the results of that t-test show? Please write a sentence uh, or two describing what that t-test shows conceptually. Hopefully you wrote something like, this t-test shows that the children asked who hid the ball were able to correctly identify the person who hid the ball. So they knew who, they, they knew the person who had hid the ball, even though the pointers were pointing at the cups, that didn't, con it did, the pointing didn't confuse them for uh, the question who hid the ball, but because before it had confused them, when they were asked, who knows where the ball is, then we can correctly determine now that these children were not merely 
engaging in an automated trigger, uh, sorry, an automated search response to see where the ball is hidden, but rather they were answering the actual question that was posed previously, who knows where the ball is, and this time, who hid the ball. My next question here is, why didn't the authors report an estimated Cohen's D for the first pointing t-test, but they did for the second one? So this is the first t-test here, and down here is the second t-test for the pointing conditions. Why did they report a D here, but not up here? Take a moment and write out an answer. Hopefully you said something like, in the first condition, the t was not significant, and so you don't usually compute a d after a non-significant t-score. Down here, the t was significant, and so you do compute a d. Recall that what a t-test is asking is, is there a difference? And we sometimes say, there is a significant difference even though what we mean is there's a statistically significant difference. But the question of effect size is, how big is the difference? So up here, if there is no difference, then there's no reason to ask how big is the difference. But down here, there is a difference, so we say, how big is the difference? And this time, holy crap, it's absolutely enormous, 7.59. Why don't you take a moment and write on a scrap of paper an, esti an interpretation of the estimated Cohen's D for the second pointing t-test. So this one here, write an interpretation of what that really means. Hopefully you wrote something like the, um, the children who performed in this second condition where they answered the question, who hid the ball? were seven standard deviations greater than you would expect by chance. Seven standard deviations greater in their performance than you would expect them to be just by chance, that 50% level. All right, let's work through a third paper. This is our third and final one. This one's called, Get Me Out of This Slump! Visual Illusions Improve Sports Performance. Here's the introduction. One of the reasons we, the authors, enjoy going to live college basketball games is to watch the antics of the student section. We love watching the students' creativity and trying to pump up the home team and distract the visiting team, especially during free throws. Such escapades made us question whether manipulating what athletes see can influence their subsequent performance. Perception is clearly important for performance. For instance, when athletes look directly at a target without moving their eyes, a pattern known as the quiet eye, they're more successful in making free throws, putting, and uh, performing a variety of other tasks. The quiet eye might lead to more successful performance by focusing attention on targets and helping athletes to ignore distractors. Additionally, the quiet eye might change the way targets look. Targets presented in the fovea look bigger than those in the periphery, so the quiet eye might lead athletes to perceive targets as bigger. Okay, I'm going to take a moment and kind of interpret this for us. Uh, this pattern known as the quiet eye is, uh, is a phenomenon where if you stare at something without moving your eyes around, then you're better able to do sports things like f throw, make three, sorry, free throws and putting and other kinds of sports things. And they want to know what is the reason for this. It could be that we're, we're ignoring distractions by focusing on the target, or it could be that the target actually appears bigger. And the reason why they think that might be is because if something, a picture, some kind of target is presented in the fovea, that's the exact middle of the eye. So it's the back part of the eye where all of the, um, uh, like the, the most photoreceptors lie, and it's best able to um, process visual information. So if you're looking directly at a target, then that target, that image, looks bigger than if it's just slightly, um, if you're like staring at something else and you're using your peripheral vision to look at the target. 
Misperceiving a target as bigger could influence performance in one of three ways. It could disrupt performance because the observer might aim for a location that does not correspond with the target. In this case, the misperception will result in worse performance. So imagine, if you thought that the basketball hoop was enormous, like three feet across, you could throw your basketball at it and and completely miss the hoop, but if you were staring at it and you thought it was way bigger than it was, you might be aiming for a part of the hoop that wasn't actually there. So then you would do worse. However, actions and explicit perceptions may not be influenced by illusions to the same degree. That is, there may be dissociations between perceptions and visually guided actions, such that illusions, which fool conscious perception, do not influence subsequent actions. In this case, misperceiving a target as bigger would not affect performance. So we're saying another possibility here is that it doesn't actually relate to your behavior. You might perceive it as bigger, but it might actually make zero difference in how well you perform. A final alternative is that misperceiving a target as bigger could enhance performance. Bigger targets feel as if they should be easier to hit, so people may feel more confident when aiming for a bigger target. Given that increased confidence improves performance, a perceptually bigger target may also lead to enhanced performance. Here, we report an experiment in which we tested these possibilities. So the goal here of this study is to see if you um, have kind of this phenomenon of the quiet eye where you um, visually perceive something as bigger, does it make your performance worse or not change at all or make it better? Here's the method. 36 participants putted to two different sized holes. One was 5 centimeters and one was twice as big, 10 centimeters. Both were 10 centimeters in depth, so they were the same depth of hole, but one was narrower around than the other. A downward facing projector displayed a ring of 11 small or 5 large circles around each hole to create an Ebbinghaus illusion. Okay, now it's important that we understand this because we've got actually one hole. Uh, sorry, we've got two holes, but in each condition, we've just got, we're just working with one hole. We've either got a five centimeter hole or a 10 centimeter hole, but whatever hole they have, there's also circles being shown by a projector, like a, like just, just a light projector that shows big circles or small circles. And they look probably something like this. If you've got a hole that you're actually trying to put to, and you've got light circles just visually projected around that hole, if those circles are small, then this will be perceived as bigger. Then, in this case, the exact same size circle in the center looks smaller if it's surrounded by large light circles. So these are just projections of light here. They're not actually holes, just projections of light placed around this hole. This hole looks smaller here than it does here, even though they're the same size. That's called the Ebbinghaus illusion. For each hole and illusion combination, participants stood at a computer approximately 1.7 meters from the hole, and they used Microsoft Paint to draw a circle that matched the hole's size. So as you might be able to guess here, the researchers are having them draw this hole so that they can get an, a, a measure, an objective measure of how big the students think the holes are that they're putting to. And they would expect that the holes would be perceived as different sizes depending on the Ebbinghaus illusion. And so the circles in Microsoft Paint would reflect different size holes, even though the holes they're putting to are actually all the same size. So then they attempted 10 putts from a distance of three and a half meters. And we recorded how many balls dropped into the hole. Presentation order was counterbalanced across participants, which means that sometimes they started with the um, small holes around, and sometimes they started with the big holes around, but then whichever one they started with, they swapped to the other. Data from four participants were removed because these participants were outliers, as determined by box plot graphs. A box plot graph looks like this. I'm going to explain 
what they're doing when they remove outliers. First, this right here is the median. Remember, the median is the middle number when you line them all up from lowest to biggest. In this case, the numbers are lined up from lowest to largest in a vertical rather than horizontal row. But the middle number is the median. This is the 75th percentile, which means this is 75% uh, of the scores are below that line and 25% of the scores are above that line. This is the 25th percentile, meaning 25% of the scores fall below that and 75% fall above that. This is called the interquartile range. This is the middle 50%. What falls between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, that is the middle 50% of scores. These here are the outliers. They're defined as any data point that's more than 1.5 interquartile ranges beyond the middle 50%. Now I know that's confusing, so I'm going to explain that in a second, but first I just want to say that these here are participant numbers, not scores. So these are the scores here on this y-axis from 0 to 20, and these numbers wouldn't make sense if they were scores because 2 would fall down here. Instead, this is participant number 2, participant number 11, number 7, 14. This is an interquartile range, as I said before. This is 1.5 interquartile ranges. It's 50% bigger than that. So if I took this and I just added half of it, half of it again, then this is 1.5 interquartile ranges. If we move that beyond the middle 50%, so this right here is the middle 50%, if we take this right here and move it beyond there and mark a line right there, this is the line that determines where an outlier falls. Anything above that, or if we did the same thing down here and moved it down and we had scores below that, anything above or below that value is defined as an outlier. This right here is the highest data point except for outliers. And this is the lowest data point except for any lower outliers that might have been down here. Of course, there aren't any because this data set gets capped off at zero. That's the lowest possible value. There's no negative numbers here. But this is the lowest possible value. This is the highest possible value. So the question I have is, do you agree with Witt's decision to remove those four outliers from his study? Why or why not? Take a moment, write that out. If you feel you need more information before deciding, what information would you like? When might you remove an outlier? What other options do you have? Take a moment and write those out. Hopefully you indicated that there's some skepticism about Witt's decision to remove outliers. It's uh, true that this is a published paper in a peer-reviewed journal, so it's obviously an acceptable practice to remove the outliers, or this paper wouldn't have been published. That said, in an early, early module, I can't remember, module 1 or 2, something like that, we talked about what we could do with outliers. One of the approaches that you can use is called fencing. You would probably remember that fencing is to take an outlier and bring it in from its extreme position to something that's still extreme but not quite as extreme and artificially make a cutoff. So in this image here, you might say these four values could be artificially changed in your spreadsheet and just erase the, this is probably a score of like 17 or something like that, erase the 17 and artificially make it 15. Take this 18, make it 15. Erase this 20, make it 15. And so you would just erase these numbers and replace them with this value that's, the, that's some cutoff value of 1.5 interquartile ranges beyond the middle 50%. So we could fence them by bringing them in to still let them be extreme. They're still extreme. They're still far greater than the median. 
but they're not so extreme that they're falling way out in the outliers. And then that would that would allow them to still play a role in the statistic and not just be kicked out of the statistic like they weren't really like like these people didn't exist or like these people weren't valid. The only time when it's actually acceptable in my opinion to remove outliers is if the outliers are demonstrably false scores if they're not real people or if there's something extreme or abnormal about the people that would have led to their getting these scores but if that were the case you should probably um, have disallowed them from participating in your study in the first place so uh, like, for instance, if you realized at some point that 20 was an impossible score and they should never have got that and it was just a typo, but you can't figure out what that score was supposed to really be, then you might kick that score out. But otherwise, fencing is a better approach. Another approach that we described in that earlier module is to run the data both ways and dis and uh, that, that means with the outliers included and without the outliers included and uh, calculate your t-test twice and see whether those outliers significantly change the outcomes of the t-test. You would report both of those t-tests and you would say this one is with the outliers, this one's without the outliers, and then if they said the same thing then you could say it doesn't matter whether you include the outliers. But if say, they said two different things then you'd have to temper your conclusions about the study just based on um, uh, whether those outliers were the reason for finding a significant finding. All right, let's go through the results of this study. The illusion influenced the perceived size of the five centimeter hole. There's a T listed there with 31 degrees of freedom. It equals 2.87, a P value of less than 0.01, a D value of 0.51, and subsequent putting performance so it influenced both the perceived size and also the performance t31 equals negative 2.66 p less than 0.05 d equals 0.54 and then it says c figure one i've um, adapted figure one to fit here on this slide participants made more successful putts when the five centimeter hole was perceptually larger so note that this graph shows performance and perceived size so people's performance is the number of successful putts how many times they got it in the hole these are the averages and these bars here represent the standard error okay this is the perceived size of the hole as measured in Microsoft Paint and if they had a big surround then they thought the hole was smaller than if it had a little surround where they thought the hole was bigger all right, the, the surrounding circles did not influence perceived size of the 10 centimeter hole. So remember, they sometimes putted to a 5 centimeter hole and sometimes to a 10 centimeter hole. The Ebbinghaus illusion didn't work for this bigger hole. As you can see here, the T is uh, 0.77, a P greater than 0.44, a D equals 0.14, and the small surround... Um, mean and standard deviation and the big surround mean and standard deviation uh, descriptive statistics are given there they go on we are unclear why the surrounding circles did not influence an illusion sorry it did not induce an illusion for the 10 centimeter hole though the surrounding circles were smaller relative to the 10 centimeter hole than to the 5 centimeter hole and smaller surrounding circles have less of an effect on perceived size in the Ebbinghaus illusion so they're giving a possible explanation of why they think maybe the Ebbinghaus didn't work for the big holes. Given the lack of an effect of the surround on the perceived size of the 10 centimeter hole, this served as a control condition that allowed us to examine whether putting performance was influenced by apparent size or by other factors related to the surrounding circles. So whenever you do a study, you're never quite sure if maybe your performance is affected by the illusion itself or by some extraneous factor like maybe these lights were because the circles were bigger maybe those lights were brighter and that was what affected the performance rather than the actual si the perceived size of the hole and so they use this 10 centimeter one as a control condition given that the Ebbinghaus illusion didn't work 
So for the 10 centimeter hole, we found that performance was not affected by the surrounding circles. And they give a T test here. T equals 0.37, P greater than 0.71, D equals 0.07. Uh, and here they've given us descriptive statistics again. This suggests that the significant effect of the surround on putting to the 5 centimeter hole was due to the hole's perceived size rather than other factors related to the surrounding holes. So remember, uh, sorry, to the surrounding circles. So remember, up here we've said that the performance, the actual putting, was not affected by the surrounding circles. Uh, it, like it didn't matter if the when you're doing the 10 centimeter hole, it didn't matter if you had bright big circles or small little circles. And so that suggests that when you do find a difference for the small size holes, the five centimeter holes between the big circle surrounds and the little circle surrounds, when you do see the difference for the five centimeter holes, the reason for that is because of the illusion and not because of like brighter lights or dimmer lights or something like that. My question for you here before we move on is what type of t-test is WIT performing in this study? Hopefully you recognize that this is a repeated measures t-test. Uh, it, it, sorry, it's multiple repeated measures t-tests. Each one of these is comparing two conditions of the same people. So here he's comparing the perceived size of the hole between people who had the big surround and the little surround and here he's preparing he's here he's comparing the putting performance of people who did the big surround and little surround down here he does similar comparisons between people when they had big surrounds and little surrounds which t-test is evaluating whether these two means are significantly different so here we have a mean of a big surround and a mean of a little surround and we, you can kind of look at what the mean value is by comparing it against the y-axis here, and you can see what the score is. So I want to know, uh, in other words, which t-test is comparing these two bars with each other? Pause your video and try to figure out which of these t-tests up here are comparing those two scores. Hopefully you were able to figure out that B is the correct answer here, that this t-test, which is listed in the article right here, is comparing, uh, is the t-test that's comparing these two. And the way we know that is because this is saying right here that um, the illusion, the Ebbinghaus illusion, influenced subsequent putting performance. And this is a graph of performance right here. And so because this is the the situation where the big surround and the little surround are different because of the Ebbinghaus solution, we know that this has to be the first condition with the small five centimeter holes and not the big condition with the 10 centimeter holes because these are different and down here we knew that these actually aren't different. Which t-test is evaluating whether these two means are significantly different? In other words, which t-test is comparing these two bars with each other? Hopefully you are able to discern that uh, uh, A is the correct answer. And the reason we know that is because this graph is showing the difference in uh, the big surround versus the little surround in terms of perceived size, how many centimeters the two holes were based on those light surrounds. Um, in, in terms of their perceived size. Because there's a difference between the two, we know that this has to be the small hole, the 5 centimeter hole, because the 10 centimeter hole wasn't different based on the big surround or the little surround. They weren't perceived differently. And the fact that this mean and this mean are different suggests that this is the smaller hole where there was a difference. So because we're comparing the perceived size and because they're actually different, then we can come up here and we can look at this t-test and know that this t, which is comparing the perceived size of the 5 centimeter hole, is the t-test that's asking, is this mean of 6.7 or whatever different from this mean of 6.9 or whatever? Um, and uh, are those two values 
statistically different from each other? Are they actually different? Did this big surround versus the little surround really make a difference in the perceived sizes of the holes? And the answer to that question, because the P is less than 0.01, is yes, it made a difference. Now, before we wrap up this module, I'd like to take a moment and um, remind you how to write your hypotheses in the three types of t-tests, depending on whether they are two-tailed or one-tailed. That is, not directional or directional. Remember that a two-tailed t-test is describing a situation where we have a research question that doesn't determine a specific hypothesis. In each of the above studies that we talked about, the researchers proposed two alternate explanations and said, we want to know which one is the right answer. For instance, people could perform better on sports or the same on sports or worse on sports, depending on what the illusion does to like how the illusion works on their um, uh, on their visual acuity. So in that case, they're not proposing a specific direction, whether the performance would go up or down. They just want to know what happens. Does it go up or down? And so they are going to put their predicted um, their predicted critical t values in the two tails of the normal distribution the two tails, so it's non-directional, no specific guess. In a one-tailed t-test, researchers would say something like, we believe that, uh, this, that this treatment will improve scores, or that it will do something that will cause them to rise. Or they might say, this uh, treatment will lower scores, it will make them worse, or something like that. But the, the one-tailed tests will put all of the critical T region in one side of a distribution. And remember, if you're wrong about which direction, which prediction you made, and it goes the opposite direction, even if it is it an extreme in the opposite direction, you still can't conclude if you use this kind of um, predictive directional hypothesis. You still can't conclude that the treatment had any effect because you predicted the wrong direction. So it's risky to use a one-tailed test uh, in case things don't go the way you predict they will. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so here we have the null hypothesis is that the mean of the treated group is equal to some number. And this is the mean of the population or some hypothesized value. Um, it, it, it could be based on logic or something like that. But it's going to be equal to some number. if the and, and that is what you'd expect if the null hypothesis were true. And if the alternative hypothesis were true, then you would predict that the mean of the treated group is not equal to that number. It might be... Um, different from the from the rest of the population that you took them from, for instance. In a one-tailed t-test, a single sample uh, hypothesis would be written as the mean of the treated group is less than or equal to the, the mean of this value. But remember, we usually, when we're doing a uh, one-tailed test, we usually like to write the alternative hypothesis first because that makes better sense. We would say the mean of the treated group is greater than some number because we think that the treatment increased their scores. If we thought that it would happen the other direction, that it would decrease their scores, then we would flip this around and we would write this is less than, the mean of the treated group is less than some population value. And whatever we write here, then we just flip it the other direction and add that equal sign. And that's our null hypothesis. In the case of an independent samples uh, t-test, we would write our hypotheses like this. The null hypothesis is that the mean of the treated group minus the mean of the untreated group is nothing. There is no difference. The difference is nothing. Or, alternatively, the mean of the treated group minus the mean of the untreated group is something other than zero. It either got, either the treated group got higher or lower, but there is a difference. The, the difference, the subtraction between those two is something other than zero. There's another way you can write this, and that is that just the mean of the first group, the treated group, and the mean of the second group, the untreated group, are the same. You could also say that the mean of the treated and the mean of the untreated are different. So those are two possible ways of writing this out, and I'll accept either on your homework and tests. You 
when you're doing a one-tailed test, you need to say that the null hypothesis is that the, or, oh, sorry, we remember we always start with the alternative hypothesis when we're doing a directional test. So that would say the mean of the treated group minus the mean of the untreated group is greater than zero because the treated group would be higher. So this minus that would be higher than zero. Or the null hypothesis would be the opposite of that. Just the difference between them is less than or equal to zero. So their scores got worse or stayed the same. Just like I showed you up above, there's a second way you can write this. The alternative hypothesis is that the mean of the treated group is higher than the mean of the untreated group. And then if you did that, then you'd write the null hypothesis is that that mean of the treated group is less than or equal to the mean of the untreated group. So you just flip this sign and add the equal. And basically you're saying that um, the treated group uh, just stayed the same or got worse than the untreated group. Okay, finally, if you're running a repeated measures test, remember we use this interesting notation here where we say the mean difference. This D stands for difference. So the difference between the first condition and the second condition uh, is nothing. There is no difference. Or alternatively, if the treatment worked, then the mean of the difference uh, scores is something other than zero. So it did get higher or lower. And if you're doing a one-tailed test instead, then you would write the null sorry the alternative hypothesis is that the mean difference is greater than zero if you predicted that they improved you could also flip this the other direction if you had, pre had predicted the opposite way and then the alternative sorry the null hypothesis is that the mean difference is less than or equal to zero now remember in each of these cases the reason why we're using this mu symbol instead of just the mean symbol even though we've collected samples is because we're not trying to say anything about our samples we don't care about the 30 people that we collected and measured in our study. Well, you know, they're children of God too, so fine, we care about them. But the thing is, we don't actually want to say anything about them. What we're trying to do is extrapolate from the small sample to a greater population. And so in each of these cases, we're using the mu symbol because we want to say something about the population mean, not the sample mean. We don't care about the sample mean. We want to say the population of people who have ever been or ever will be treated is the same as the population of all the people who ever have or ever won't be untreated, right? So we're just imagining to ourselves these imaginary, these imaginary populations of all the people who could get that treatment that we're giving or who wouldn't have that treatment that we're giving and we're trying to trying to say something about the treatment in general at the population level rather than at the sample level and that my friends is the end of this module please go ahead and do your homework and uh, in that in that assignment you will find that you need to identify in any given research situation what is the uh, uh, what is the kind of t-test it's asking you to perform whether it's one or two tailed and write out the null and alternative hypotheses that match that research situation. Good luck!